just 11 minutes for 6 a.m. Apologies for the slight delay, but we are here all the same to ensure that your day kickstarts on a very good note. My name is Linda Alela, and it is time for Morning Cafe, the program that sets the pace for you, of course, updating you on what is happening on matters news as we expound some more on candid discussions in regards to these particular issues. Of course, on the current affairs segment and later on, we also have some lifestyle segment, and today we're all about martial arts going to be an interesting session for you starting right now all the way to 9 a.m so ensure that you keep me company as i get to entertain you educate you and inform you my name is linda lila once again let's kick start by taking a look at the stories that we have prepared right now and i have a right reminder that i'll be taking you through the stories and the newspaper also alongside lily mwangi who is actually the panel of the day or the guest of the day on this particular segment of newspaper review so karibu sana as always, it's a pleasure to have you joining us. And let's do this. As of course, we take a look at these particular stories. And um, it has started a clinical trial for a drug that might just be the cure for coronavirus. Ten patients at Aga Khan University Hospital are set to undergo the trial that uses a drug called Actrema. This is as the number of COVID-19 cases in the country rises to 14,168 after 397 more people tested positive as of yesterday. Kenya is one of two African countries that have started clinical trials for a drug that might just be the cure for coronavirus. According to credible sources, 10 patients admitted at the Aga Khan Hospital are set to undergo a three-month time trial that will utilize the use of a drug called Actemra. Actemra is used to inhibit interleukin-6 receptors to prevent pneumonia that has been a characteristic of patients infected with COVID-19. This as the Ministry of Health says the progress made in the search for a vaccine in first world countries is huge and promising in the fight against coronavirus. That's promising because if a vaccine has proceeded to that stage, it means it has passed these other tests. Uh, I, I heard that there is a vaccine in the U.S. that's now entering phase three. Uh, we know that there is a vaccine in the U.K. that is also uh, progressing uh, well. So the entire world is looking to a successful vaccine that comes out in good time and that will be able to protect people from, uh, from getting COVID-19. Dr. Rashid, however, says much like in the testing of COVID-19, there are limitations in third world countries to adopt many of the manufactured vaccines due to limitations in resources. Just like we told you about our testing, limitations with testing, the limitations of getting the, the, the equipment and getting the reagents because of the global supply chain and the demands and the preferences. You know, the more developed, richer worlds where, where, where these products are produced are the ones to benefit first and we end up in the end of the queue. The number of COVID-19 cases in the country rose to 14,168 after 397 more people tested positive for the virus in the last 24 hours. Nairobi, 239 cases, Kiambu, 33, Machakos, 27, Nyeri, 17, Busia, 16, Nakuru, 12, Mombasa, 12, Kajiado, 10, Migori 8, Wasingishu 8, Kericho 5, Narok 3, Laikipia 3, Kisi, Kisumu, Lamu and Nyandarua 1 each. Seven of the new COVID-19 survivors were on home-based care, whereas 55 were released from various hospitals across the country as 12 more people succumbed to the virus. For TV47, I'm Zainab Mohammed. And uh, to the stories related to COVID-19 or the cases of COVID-19 right in the country and across the globe, Oxford vaccine offers hope for taming a virus as captured on page 9 of the People Daily and 14,168 total cases that have been recorded so far, 397 as of yesterday. Lily, if you can hear me, good morning. Can you hear me? Lily? Can you hear me? Good morning. 
really i'm afraid we're not able to hear you very well but anyway we'll be taking a look at that and come back to you later to expound some more this has captured on the, of course the people daily equally on the front page of the standard newspaper there is an issue in regards to of course covid 19 and how much we're dealing with it and a big promise in covid 19 vaccine hunt as captured right here i'd expounded some more on page six of the Sunday newspaper and whether indeed this is going to be a sigh of relief is a question of wait and see. Virus drug trials begin at Nairobi Zagakan Hospital. Oxford Varsity Vaccine is safe for use, experts say, and coronavirus tracker. How close are we to a vaccine is a question that everyone is asking right now. And indeed, crossing fingers that it all works well. Lily, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Good morning. Morning. Thank you so much for finding time and we are taking a look at the numbers as of yesterday and also the possibilities of us getting a vaccine as a global fraternity. Should we cross fingers? Are we hopeful for this in regards to the reports that we are receiving one from Oxford vaccine which hope has hope, offers hope sorry, for taming virus and also the tests that are being conducted or are set to start uh, today at Aga Khan Hospital in regards to us uh, being able to achieve a vaccine or get a vaccine for COVID-19. Okay, yeah, I think uh, there's a ray of hope uh, towards getting a vaccine for coronavirus. Yeah. But unfortunately, uh, a vaccine may not come as soon as we think it will, yeah, because a vaccine will have to take very many phases of clinical trials. Mm. Right now, they have one clinical trials. They, they have to go up to phase three clinical trials for us to, to ascertain that it is safe and uh, efficient and also that it's able to combat the specific virus, yeah, the specific strain of the virus. Mm -hmm. So we are not very sure about the vaccine, but there is a ray of hope from uh, very many, you know, very many countries are trying, not only the UK, the US, and uh, other, other countries are trying. So, of course, there's a ray of hope. But uh, we should be looking, in my, in my opinion, yeah, we should be looking at more short-term goals because uh, it means that if a vaccine is going to come, it's, all, it's only going to come maybe uh, next year or probably mid next year because of the production, because of the, of the clinical trials you're talking about. So before next year, how are we going to be able to contain the virus be, between now and maybe mid next year? And That's what we should be. And before we are able to get a hold of the vaccine, and the question on board is just how much, you know, accessible will the vaccine in the event that we are able to get it be, especially to the vulnerable, vulnerable countries, of course, Africa for that matter, UK the other day ordering numerous and numerous, talking of 90 million doses of vaccines. It's a clear indication that in the event that we have it, then what is left of the people who are equally struggling and grappling for it, the likes of African countries for that matter? Of course, there's going to be a global, uh, a global, um, what do you call it? There's going to, uh, 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 what do you call it? We're going to have a strain mm. because of the resources are very few. And of course, if you're going to get that specific vaccine from Oxford, yeah. it means that there is global demand mm. for the vaccine. Meaning that uh, before countries like ours, sorry to say, get to get the vaccine, it might take a little bit of time because of the production and all that. Mm. But uh, they hope because, of course, if they come up with the vaccine, it's not only going to be produced at Oxford because uh, so many other labs and so many other facilities or institutions have the capacity to produce it. But uh, what we should be thinking right now is what do we do with ourselves between now and maybe mid next year? because the vaccine might or might not work. That's mm. a possibility. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the strain of the virus might mutate between now and next year. So what are we going to do with this window period where we're not having a, a, a permanent solution per se, but we're having the vaccine, uh, the, the, the virus here with us? So we should be thinking about maybe the short term. Also in the long term, uh, we have labs. We have Camry, we have very many institutions offering medi medicine in this country. Mm -hmm. How do we put their capacity so yeah. that they are also able to produce uh, or to also yeah, come up with once we have the vaccine, how do you now boost their capacity to be able to produce the, the, the vaccine at a local level? Mm -hmm.
All right, well, we can cross fingers for the best as, of course, we continue to ponder in the same. And let's proceed to the next story. Uh, more than 10 people have been critically injured following a stampede at the Nikoni Channel yesterday evening. The incident occurred when one of the gates at uh, the waiting bay were opened and as passengers rushed to board the ferry, scores were injured in a stampede. And most of those injured were women during the incident that happened on the island side. In a statement, the Kenya Ferry Services, MD Bakari Goa, however, did not speak about the incident but said that at around 3.30 hours, MV Mkwale while at mainland a ramp hit MV Safari, gapping a hole on the side which caused water ingress, flooding the engine room. Asa mimi mwenyezi mungu haka nusuru, nikashika ukuta hivi, nikawambia nzangu wanine, tusuwe meni hapa hapa, na tumsualie mtume. Bila hivyo, tutakufa sote. Basi, inshallah mwenyezi mungu, wale watu wa, wa, wakanisikiza. Tukasimama pale pale, hatukupata kupata maadara yoyote, mpaka watu wote wakafungua. Kuja kukungua hivi, ndo tunapata wenzetu wengi, wamesambaratika chini. Wameomia, wengine wame toka mapovu, wengine damu zina, zina watiririka. Nikaanza kuambia subra mina Allah, subra mina Allah. Tulieni hapa hapa tu lipo. Hivyo ndivyo lipo kuwa, lakini kuliko kuna fujo sana. Ye, tulikuwa tumpale kwa kipanda, sasa wale watu waka, waka wengi, wakaanza wakati walikuwa wengi. Sasa waka wengi, sasa wakati veri ilikuwe na kuja. Wana watu, watu wanaone na taka kubeba, ndia wakakucha kwa wengi sasa. Wakaraliana sasa. Hine musukumano. Waka nkuku, hata mili kasubo ni kangia kupanda mbeti. Hata nika unagiza hata shikono. Mumu miyake? Eh? Mumu miyake? Mumu kuwa hapa, nasikia kama mumu ni mumu miyake. Koto likuwa nyaga ama likuwa jia? Kwa nyaga na. Likuwa nimetoka kazini, nafika pale juu, napata jia. Nimesimama vizuri. I was waiting for me to nilikuwa nangoja nivuke hivi sasa penye nimesimama badala wale watusaidie ndio wanatuumiza one of the officers just beat me with that no reason slapped me ati nitoke mbele hapo na mimi sina kosa yoyote sasa hizo nimebeba bag yangu kila kitu yako badala aende and tusaidie ananipiga makofi amenipiga makofi for no reason all right, uh, that's uh, not so much so extensively captured or in uh, the newspaper, but uh, something worth discussing. And uh, Lily, coming to you, really, there's so much fear on, of course, the infrastructures across the country. And now this even worse, uh, where, of course, hundreds and hundreds of Kenyans, hundreds and thousands of Kenyans use the ferry to cross from one point to the other, to Likoni, to this other side. So, I mean... The fact that there's not been assurance of safety at these, uh, you know, ferries and all that, you know, brings chills or sends chills down the spines of many. And now such occurrences really uh, get us to that point of remembering the likes of Mtongwe. I don't know whether you were there back then, years and years back. I think I was still too young when we could hear of how much, of course, the ferry had capsized and, you know, numerous and numerous of Kenyans had lost their lives out of this. I mean, and every other time you're going to that place to cross the ferry, there's some level of excitement, but so much so of fear of getting from point A to point B. Yeah, yeah, I believe uh, it's not been, and yes, we had the, the famous incident of uh, the, the woman who, you know, uh, found into the ferry to mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But I believe uh, where we are at as a country right now, we need to already have had a sustainable solution to that uh, ferry crossing towards that side. Because uh, for, we've been on the discussion for so long as a country on what we should do, and so far, we all, we all we all can agree that the ferry cannot guarantee towards anyone. You don't know if actually if you get on the ferry towards from this side you're going to cross to the other side. But uh, as, a, as I feel this is an issue the government should be looking at very seriously because uh, as we continue to grow and as we continue to grow our economy as a country, it means that we are opening up 
uh, the, the country into growth, uh, and also we, we need the infrastructure all over the country so that anybody can be able to transact from point A to point B. You can be able to move your goods from point A to point B without having to worry about your safety or even the safety of your goods. So this is something I feel the government should be looking at at a long-term solution. We have had, I don't know, ferries being bought and whatever, but the, all this is not solving the main problem. Mm -hmm. So let us look to the safety of our people. Do we have, can we have something or a sustainable solution or a road that can cross towards the other side or a bridge, you know, that can cross towards the other side so that we can have, we can minimize these accidents that mm -hmm. always happen uh, at the ferry. Mm -hmm. All right, and speaking of which, yes, uh, it is here captured on page 15 of the People Daily. 20 people injured in a stampede at Likoni Fori and stalled after it collided with another vessel on the sides as it's overloaded passengers on the mainland side. Different reactions coming in regards to that, but we can only hope that indeed there's going to be some bolts of operations and, you know, I mean, just ensuring that also the ferry services uh, to ensure that management of the equipment are, is done, you know, on a constant, uh, of course, review for the safety of the people moving on and that aside personnel in Nyeri County are on high alert after 12 of their colleagues at a private hospital tested positive for COVID-19. Meanwhile, Kitui County recorded two cases of nurses who tested positive for COVID-19. Eli Lugova with the details. The increasing number of COVID-19 cases in the country continues to exert pressure on an already overwhelmed healthcare system. Nyeri County has the latest cases of healthcare workers with 12 testing positive, whereas Kitui County recorded two positive cases. The medics from the facility located at the heart of Nyeri town are currently in isolation. 47 in this county. Out of those 47, about 11 were mepona. How wengine tuko nao katika isolation centers zetu. Wengine ni madaktari. Twelve of them ni madaktari. Wameambukizwa na wagonjwa wawili walio kuwa hapo. Kwa hivyo, kuna tatizo na ni vizuri tujue. Meanwhile, the Kenya Medical Practitioners, Pharmacists and Dentists Union KMPDU has once again taken issue with the government's move to hire medics from Cuba despite the availability of locally trained doctors who are unemployed. The union now wants the government to hire 50 healthcare workers per county as one of the interventions in combating coronavirus. 20 Cuban doctors are already in the country after the government struck a deal to have them work for a period of at least six months. We have seen 20 Cuban doctors who are said to be specialists being brought on board. The irony is that it has taken more than four months for the government to engage its own local doctors to combat COVID-19. This comes as the country's disease burden continues to spike, surpassing the 14,000 mark and affecting the medical fraternity. One doctor, Doreen Lugaliki, and two other nurses have already succumbed to the illness with more than 546 others infected in the country. Eli Logova. TV 47, Nairobi. And still on COVID-19, Governor Dr. James Nyoro has issued an ultimatum to all bars, restaurants and clubs selling alcohol to shut immediately. The governor has said that markets flouting COVID-19 containment measures will be closed. And this is in Kiambu County, as Mwangi Maina now reports. Speaking at the Kiambu County COVID-19 Isolation Hospital in Tigoni, Kiambu Governor Dr. James Nyoro says eateries that were allowed to reopen have been turned into bars that operate even beyond curfew hours. Nyoro directing the establishments to close before coming Sunday. And every bar today in Kiambu is operating as wines and spirit. We are saying tafadari, funga hiyo wines and spirit. If you don't funga between now and Sunday, tutakuja jumatatu, tutaifunga, tutarivoke your license, and never again in the life of Gambu County shall you receive a license to operate anything related to bar and restaurant. Nyoro attributes the sharp rise in COVID-19 infections in his county 
to the don't care attitude and flouting of containment measures by Kiambu residents. The governor has threatened to close markets by Friday if they will be found violating containment measures. In the public health will be revisiting markets and I want to announce that we shall be closing markets. We'll be closing markets that are not abiding to the regulations that we had said. That may hurt business. Now the thing is, before we come to close next week, we would probably appeal to people so that they can start to observe the things that we've been talking about. We want to enhance and make sure that water is available, that sanitizers are available, but also the distance and putting on masks. The governor spoke at the groundbreaking ceremony in Tigoni Hospital, where another isolation center will be constructed in two months. The statue we are going to groundbreak will give us an additional uh, 100 beds, and therefore we'll see that in Tigoni we have 200 we have 330 beds which will be ready by the end of that, uh, that project. We try to do what we can. Our focus is on education, health, environment, and of course also when in some cases where we do some emergency support. And very often we do that through the MRM Foundation, which supports us to execute on many of these, many of these things. The facility will have a capacity of 104 beds and is being constructed in association with Mabati Rolling Mills. Following the recklessness of Kenyans in adhering to measures put in place by the Minister of Health to combat the spread of coronavirus, the government is forced to take punitive measures to ensure that these protocols are being observed. Mwangi Maina, TV 47. Let's flip you in again, uh, Lily, as we take a look still on uh, the combination of issues on matters COVID-19. And uh, one story captured here on the front page of the People Daily, only 15 counties are ready for COVID-19. This is a draft fact-finding report that paints a grim picture of uh, the situation in devolved units as, of course, doctors warn that about 500 healthcare workers have been infected with the virus as captured on page 4 and and, five. and also later on, I know we'll be taking a look at that story where President Uhuru Kenyatta has called upon the intergovernmental units to come on board so that they can chart the way forward. And equally, just a review on how far they have achieved this uh, in terms of dealing with COVID-19 in the country. And uh, this is set for Friday. Before Friday, I mean, what would you say about how far we've come in terms of dealing with COVID-19 at the level of the counties, Lini? Pardon? What would you say about how we have come, or how far we've come in terms of dealing with COVID-19 at the level of the counties? Okay, I mean, uh, this is a pandemic that it has, uh, it was unprecedented. Yeah. Nobody really expected uh, it happened in March. But here we are now, and uh, we have to get prepared. We have to gear up as a country. So firstly, I'd like to say we have come a long way in terms of uh, preparedness, in terms of equipping, equipping our health systems, but I believe uh, we're still not yet there. Because uh, as, you, if, yeah, as you read the report by, 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 by the gov Governor Paranya, it means that uh, less than five counties have complied uh, with the presidential di directive so far, meaning that only uh, about 15 counties are prepared mm -hmm. to handle with the 300 bed capacity and all that. Uh, putting in mind that the 300 bed capacity is not enough, if, uh, it's not even enough uh, for the counties. Mm -hmm. So meaning we have a long way to go, but I believe uh, county governments uh, really have to be on, on top of their game on this one, because this is a pandemic. This is not something that we are going to wait, I don't know until when, uh, so for us to get prepared. We've seen about 15, uh, 15 counties get the 300 bed capacity. No. Uh, many other counties are yet to get to that. We've seen uh, counties training, we've seen counties uh, buying ventilators, but if you compare uh, the target vis-a-vis -vis what we have now, yeah. we're still very far from where we should be as a country, mm -hmm. meaning that uh, govern governors need to gear up, they need to you know, step up their game towards getting prepared. And what is the most saddening part is that most counties, uh, or some of the counties, sorry, are getting prepared <laughs> with the wrong things, yeah? It's like starting to climb the tree from the top, or you see people buying body bags or uh, such kind of things, meaning that you're going to prepare for death rather than prepare for the infections themselves. 
And you've seen the mortality rate in this country is not as high as uh, it was in other countries because we've only had around 200 and something dead. But that does not mean that you, you should not get prepared. Uh, we've seen, okay, the bed capacity is there, the ventilators, are, uh, we need to, the ventilators. Aside from that, we are not seeing uh, human capacity being built up, which is very important. Mm -hmm. Like we just saw over 500 uh, health workers have been infected so far. These are our frontline uh, warriors in this war, and we are fighting an invisible enemy. Let us remember that. Meaning that uh, anybody coming into the clinic or anybody coming into the hospital is suspected or should be suspected of COVID-19 because we don't know who really has it or who doesn't have it. So meaning that we are exposing most of our health workers because of lack of PPEs or inadequate PPEs in some counties. And this means that our human capacity is, is also being overstretched as at now. Mm -hmm. Meaning that most of our frontline workers get infected, yeah. then we don't have people who are going to help us in our hospitals who we really need. Yeah. Meaning, uh, also, if you look at uh, the employment, we, we had the 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 the, the, the Waziri saying the other day that they are going to employ health workers. Which yeah. We are yet employing health workers, and we need that capacity at the uh, human capacity at the hospital. Mm -hmm. Meaning that we get to employ more more health workers as we train the existing health workers, so that yeah. we can have. Uh, adequate, we can be adequately prepared for any eventuality that may happen. Mm -hmm. All right, well, and that aside, let's pick this one. Senator Johnson Sakaja has been fined 15,000 shillings after he pleaded guilty of breaking COVID-19 rules before an open court in Kasarani, Nairobi. Sakaja was accused of flouting the curfew rules after he was found drinking with friends at 1 a.m. four hours past the 9 a.m. to 4 a.m. curfew imposed by the government to curb the spread of COVID-19 in the country. It was an unprecedented moment when Nairobi Senator John Sakaja appeared before Chief Magistrate Roslyn Oganyo. The self-acclaimed super senator was ordered to pay just 15,000 shillings fine after being found guilty of breaching the night curfew. He was found drinking alcohol at a restaurant at 1 a.m. on Saturday. The blatant violation of the set regulations by the senator mirrors double standards by the politicians who are setting the standard too high in the name of stopping the spread of COVID-19. By the time of his arrest, the youthful politician was the chair of the Senate and HOC committee in charge of the fight against COVID-19. The minimum sentence for the offense committed apparently is only Kenya shillings 20,000 or in default six months in prison. Being a first offender and in line with the sentencing policies in place, I will consider fining the Honorable Senator to pay a fine of 15,000 shillings or in default he shall serve three months in prison. The state prosecutor argued that the court should consider a harsh penalty against the senator in order to send a message to political leaders that the rules were not made for all the common citizens but are meant for all to obey at all times. However, the ruling has triggered questions over alleged selective application of the law. Many believe the fine was too lenient and the populace who look up to him could follow suit and be reckless in keeping the night curfew order. That yesterday I had written to the speaker about uh, that committee, and I meant it. Uh, and, and I mean, it, it's something that will be seen; it's visible. It will be there on the floor of the house today. And uh, we move on, and we do what we were elected to do. Critics cite the application of double standards in the enforcement of COVID-19 prevention regulations when it comes to politicians. In several instances, politicians have been seen holding political gatherings in full disregard of COVID-19 protocol and even under police protection. The same cannot be said about the common mana inchi. In one instance, a man was beaten by police to death after breaching the curfew to rush a pregnant woman in hospital on a motor. To buy. Hundreds others have been forced to quarantine facilities even without testing for COVID-19. For Sakaja and his ilk, a slap on the wrist is enough warning. At least he has learned his lesson after paying 15,000 shillings for it. The senator must have struggled to raise the near maximum fine for the offense. Well, it's a country of two laws. For TV47, I'm Nancy Kimuyu. 
All right, um, that one captured on uh, the standard newspaper too. So Kaja pleads guilty, fined 15,000 for violating rule. This I don't want us to delve into much, but do you suppose that was so much lenient of a uh, fine or uh, it was okay? First of all, I feel that uh, politicians are really letting us down in the fight uh, against coronavirus mm -hmm. because the, the first or the people in the front line who are flaunting the same rules that uh, they are, uh, were imposed mm -hmm. by the Ministry of Health and also by the President, which uh, makes many Kenyans feel or actually even believe that there is no COVID at all because everybody is wondering these are the same people who have the, you know, uh, who have the advantage of information or are privy to certain uh, information, but they're the same people who are flaunting rules. Yeah. Several instances we have seen politicians uh, you know, and gather for, with more than 15 people uh, as, the, as the required uh, gathering uh, is at the Ministry of Health. We have also seen uh, politicians not wear masks in public. We've seen them, you know, flaunting rules. And just the other day, you can see Sakaja was caught past the 9 p.m. curfew and uh, ironically being the chair of the COVID-19 ad hoc com committee in the Senate, meaning that uh, these are the same people who are implying rules. And you've also had the notion of people saying that the, the rules really apply to the poor people, the Wanjiko, yeah? So meaning that these people are really letting us down in the fight against COVID and they really need to step up their game. Uh, and, uh, as if that is not enough, a Kasipul member of parliament, Charles Omodo, was arrested, uh, you know, flouting equally just yesterday, flouting the rules again, holding rallies in Homa Bay. Uh, this is according to the police chief, uh, that is Serune. And, you know, it is just unfortunate, and especially looking at the young leaders. I mean, do you suppose that you are a youth leader or you are a youth leader? I mean, what does it make you feel when you look at these young leaders that we look up to doing whatever it is that they are doing? I feel that they are really letting us down as young people. They have sort of tarnished the youthful name into something that, you know, everybody don't, doesn't want to associate with. Mm -hmm. Basically because of how we carry out ourselves when, once we get into the leadership positions at the national level, mm -hmm. which is very unfortunate. And uh, also leading uh, from or, or also looking at the, uh, you know, community response towards the youthfulness, and also how the youth are feeling as if they can't really are, or are, are immune to this disease. This is also now adding <laughs> charcoal into the heat. So I feel that uh, young leaders, uh, and specifically our politicians, need to lead from the front. This is not an enemy. This is an enemy that doesn't you know, know politics or no tribe or no social class. It is a respecter of no man. Yeah? So mm. this uh, really should be on the front line to protect our people against COVID. They are the people who should be really doing campaigns and uh, uh, educating the masses again on how to protect themselves. But they're doing, but contrary, they're just, you know, holding rallies as if it is normal. And like what Mutaika keeps on saying that if it this disease normally, it's going to treat us abnormally. Mm -hmm. Politics will come. A time will come for us to do politics, but right now it is time for us to combat a pandemic, which we, like we said earlier, is invisible. Mm -hmm. So we should be on the front line to try and protect our people, to try and advocate for our people to wear masks, to do all that. But now uh, we cannot use the opposition or the politics of opposition and all that to flaunt truth because our lives are also at stake here. So I really, I really appeal to especially the young, the young, you know, the young leaders to step up. But also, what he did was commendable by, you know, uh, apologizing because we've seen most of the times our leaders just feel or uh, okay, like feel as if they are above the law. Mm -hmm. But right now we are seeing the law catching up with them, which is a very good precedent that, that is being set. Mm. So if we're going to, get, or we're going to get people to take this seriously, we need our politicians to be from the front, and we need a serious uh, or, or, or serious follow-up yeah. on, on, the, on the rules that we put up as a country or that are put up at the Ministry of Health to be followed by everyone. Mm -hmm. Because uh, as we all know, that we are all equal in, in the eyes of this disease. All right, and uh, yes, I agree with that. And moving on to some more politics. Um, the Wiper Party has resolved to hasten coalitions that talks with the ruling Jubilee Party. So the party says that NASA coalition is dysfunctional. Let's take a look.
the National Executive Council of the Wiper Democratic Movement resolved to move with speed to move into a coalition agreement with the ruling Jubilee Party amid the emerging political realignments in the country. Wiper says the NASA coalition is no longer functional. Even if um, we were to accept that legally we have the NASA coalition, which is registered with the registered political parties. But clearly, NASA has become dysfunctional. The party is expected to convene a special national delegates conference soon to approve the NEC determination concerning the foreseen merger. We cannot conclude a coalition agreement without calling for a delegates conference. And it will really uh, spark, in my view, the correct political realignment to which I made reference during the last uh, NEC meeting. Meanwhile, the party is expected to approve the report of the WIPA disciplinary committee that recommended the kicking out of former Machakos County Senator Johnson Modama from the party. The party says it will write to the registrar of political parties concerning the decision. We get the report and hear what they recommended and that report itself I think is a matter of now communicating with the registrar of political parties expeditiously and then deleting the name of a member from our register. Nanok Loren, TV 47. And also after, of course, dropping Mudama, who apparently also dropped wipe a long, long time ago, here we are with some bit of politics, the politics of the handshake, the politics of Jubilee, you know, looping in other parties and forming, you know, a larger coalition in what one would want to term. As party says that Raila led a coalition is dysfunctional and the only way forward is a union with the President Uhuru Kenyatta's ruling party. Probably this is something we all expected. It's nothing new in this particular case. So the Wiper Party has formally walked out of the National Super Alliance, NASA. I don't know how this will be received and we're expecting reactions from ANC. And I think the biggest person who's been against this is ANC party leader Musalia Mudavadi who says that they have a memorandum they have you know uh, the, 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 and there's not a single point where we saw of course any of the parties deciding to step out of the NASA coalition hence bringing the revenue share problem that was there in regards to who or what party should get what amount of money and of course ODM you know gladly taking the entire chance so Secretary General Judith CJ said that the party's National Executive Council meeting held yesterday Today via Zoom resolved that Wiper engages a Jubilee Party in line with the emerging political realignments in the country. Here we are. The politics is ongoing. And Mutama says, I wish you the best in your endeavor and look forward to politically engaging you in 2022 when I shall face Wiper and other political parties with my party. God willing. To you. Lily, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So it's very interesting what is playing out in our political space right now because we have seen these struggles not only in NASA, it was first in Jubilee, and now we're seeing them in NASA coalition. Yeah. And these are like main or uh, uh, the, the coalitions that are considered the main coalitions in the last mm -hmm. general election, meaning that very many Kenyans got to support either of these coalitions, and very many Kenyans have hope in these coalitions. But as what has been seen in this country t since time immemorial is that our political parties have only been just like vehicles to cross us into the next election, and then from there it's like the, the political parties are dead. We haven't seen much of accountability in our political parties or much of you know uh, what they should really be doing uh, in the five year span, meaning that we've only been using them just for convenience, and it has come. And time is now coming where we we really now we really need to get serious on how we do our party politics country. Mm -hmm. We had so many cases uh, arising from the nominations in 2017, meaning that so many people had uh, are really losing hope in the political party politics as it's playing out in our country. But all is not lost. I feel that uh, just like NASA is now uh, looking to walking out of, of of, oh, sorry, of NASA. Oh, Wiper is looking out, walking out from NASA and forming other coalitions. Of course, before now in 2022, there's going to be a lot of realignment in our party politics. But that's a, that aside, I feel that we really need to have a solid party ideologies that we really hold on to as a country because uh, we are moving on from where people are voting from uh, tribal 
politics and all that and we are going we are now transiting into a new phase of dispensation i say mm -hmm. where people more young people and more millennials are looking towards issue driven politics meaning that these politics of tribe i don't know we come from the same place are slowly being phased out meaning that we need a, a new outfit in our political parties and new ideologies that people can really uh, 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 attribute to or we can relate to in a certain political party. Mm -hmm. That being said, we also seeing a lot of monopoly in our political parties where only the you know the only the executive has a say in the political party because before NASA or before Wiper steps out from NASA, how much consultation has been done to the members of the political parties, mm -hmm. how we a vote from the members or uh, for also even from the National Executive Committee, not only from the National Executive Committee, right. but also even from the grassroots. How much of that is being followed? How much of act accountability? Because uh, as I told you earlier, we are only using this like a vehicle where it is only convenient for me as a party leader to move from this place to this place. But what about the people that, you know, that uh, believe in the ideologies of the Waipa political or, or any other political mm -hmm. party? So we, we should be really thinking about how we, you know, we change our party system or our party mm -hmm. politics, being all inclusive, and also uh, how we look into the parties being more sustainable. Mm -hmm. We are not only going to have a uh, a Jubilee or a NASA or an ODA because of a certain political phase. But this is something that can carry on generations after generation. All right. Well, that aside, uh, some bit of more, which uh, actually that has been captured on a page two of the standard newspaper, Kalonzo Dams Raila for who is parking and peace revolt in Wiper. And that aside, one of the biggest stories right here has captured cabinet lockdown and strung by a surge in COVID-19 infections on the back of reports that at least three cabinet secretaries had contracted a coronavirus. President Uhuru Kenyatta now bans nationwide tours by members of the cabinet and Uhuru Chair's Crisis Summit to review the containment measures on Friday. Of course, the total infections are standing at 14,168 as captured right there. And also on the People Daily, it's the cartoon edition, as of course there's that official lockdown or partial lockdown work from with his parliament, you know, from all these ministries, from Harambe House and all that, uh, from State House. The question is, just for how long? And as the virus continues to look and eyeing at this particular key area in the country and then you can see when Chico somewhere down there you know complaining or uh, you know just hoping that I hope they are not going to introduce a lockdown allowance that's an interesting cartoon edition right there what do you make of this Okay. This is uh, this is what, of course, uh, Wanjiko has been feeling all along, not yeah. only in COVID times, that, but even before COVID came, that, you know, our politicians are very self-centered and they only think about maybe the allowances and all that, which is a very valid feeling, by the way. Mm. But uh, what we should be looking at is, is now... Uh, looking into the politics of our country and we are stepping into 2022 and these are the reactions of Wanjiko amidst a pandemic mm -hmm. so this is something that as a politician uh, or any politician should be worried about because how how much it shows how much lack of trust we have between Wanjiko and the government and Wanjiko and the politicians yeah, yeah. but also uh, looking at the lockdown that also stems to what we have said earlier because uh, we are pre we are preaching water but uh, or we are we are preaching uh, drinking wine but preaching water yeah. meaning that um, our politicians or maybe you know our cabinet secretaries have been going through or going around the country having um, launching or or actually looking at projects that are being done or launching others and we've seen a lot of uh, social distancing being plotted in such we've seen a lot of you know lack of um, following of the of the directives and now it is coming to catch up with them uh, seeing that we're even going into a cabinet lockdown which is not very safe for a country because this is this is our leadership that is going into a lockdown so we don't really know and this is just you know like the surge is just beginning for covid we don't know how next month or you know by two months down the line, it's going to, to surge. But looking even into the international politics, we saw the Prime Minister of UK contracting COVID. We have seen other very many global leaders 
contacting this disease, meaning, like, as we said, it is not a specter of social class or any political class. It just can affect anyone. And anyone, you know, like Motai Kalo so saying, anyone can get it. So nobody is immune to the virus per se. Mm-hmm. So we should be looking at how are we implementing the rules ourselves because we are very good as a country at, uh, you know, coming up with procedures and coming up with rules, but the implementation is something very different. So how are we implementing the rules? We saw just the other day State House go into lockdown, which is a very dangerous trend that we are, we are following as a country yeah. because uh, of working. Now, going to the other issue of allowances, I believe that uh, our politicians should be really worried about or how the common monarchy at the ground is is looking at things mm. because it shows the disappointment from the Wanjiko towards our political class yeah. and this should be a very worrying uh, a very, this should be should bring a lot of worry to the to the politicians so how do they change this perception that they only think about themselves and don't really think about the people who elected them in the grassroots. Mm-hmm. All right, and speaking of which, uh, of course, later on we get to expound some more on that. And we'll be taking a look at uh, the key powerhouse women, or we say the powerhouse women, we'd call them, Anne Waiguru and Amina Mohammed, and how they are faring on in respective, of course, docketed areas, especially at this type, particular time when there's been a reprieve for uh, uh, that is uh, Anne Waiguru in regards to the cases as captured right here. Waiguru's doubles victory in fight with MCAs captured on page eight as High Court bars Kirinyaga County Assembly from a Accessing the cash until a case challenging the controversial budget estimate is hard. And that aside, also we're taking a look at CS Amina Mohammed's candidature to the World Trade Organization and of course whether she stands a chance. But not before I let go, before we go, of course, also we take a look at the Senate as of course which reaches out to Ryla to end revenue sharing a standoff. I wish we would have expounded some more on that in one minute or so. Uh, this standoff within the county, I mean, what do you make of it? And uh, I'm crossing fingers that, of course, the lockdown does not hit the Senate before they get to address this. I hope it does not hit the Senate anyway, in a, in a minute or so. Yeah, I hope the lockdown doesn't hit the Senate before we get uh, rid of this. I, I feel that uh, this revenue or the, the revenue allocation of the sharing of, of, the, of the revenues is a very important topic in this country that is long overdue. And uh, what we are seeing is a stalemate between how we share revenue and uh, between, okay, maybe the population at, at, at a certain area and also maybe the, the distance of the area covered in a certain area. Mm. So uh, what is happening is that most of uh, the, the, the areas that are set or most of the, of the, of the counties that are set to lose the revenue uh, are mostly affiliated to uh, UDM, or that is Raila's side. Yeah. So this is why we are seeing this, uh, this, uh, this, this tussle between how do they get, and of course the hardship politics playing in and all that. But that aside, I believe it is time we had that discussion as a country, and it's a very important discussion on how we share revenue. Uh, for a very long time, very many ca- counties have been considered marginalized. Well, others are actually feeling, you know, more marginalized because of the numbers that they have. Yeah. But this is a very, this is a, a tussle that needs not only to be solved because, you know, our Senate has time and time again uh-huh. proven to be very politically alienated. Right. So you know, uh, we might get to a solution or we may get to a conclusion that is very uh, politically inclined. But this is a topic that needs us to sit down as a country and think about how do we really get to share our revenue, uh-huh. either between the people or the distance or, or, you know, the area covered right. within a certain. Okay. So this is a topic and uh-huh. we hope that tomorrow they come into, uh, you know, a conclusion because the more they delay, yeah. the more we have is at the county, uh, meaning that the service the delivery at the county is going to be affected yeah. and we are in the a pandemic. So this is not something that we should be doing, right? We should be thinking about right now. Mm-hmm. But uh, my personal stand would Let's be, wind up uh-huh. as we wind up, please. Let, 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 us, let us look at uh, population rather than let, uh, looking at the distance covered. Because if you look at very many, like for example, for instance, Nairobi mm-hmm. has a very huge population base, meaning yeah. that the services uh, cannot be compared to mm-hmm. any other county that is elsewhere. Okay. So also politics uh, 
of 2022 is going to play in because senators who come from those areas that are going to have the resources reallocated are, going, are feeling that that is going to be used against them uh -huh. by the people they are against in 2022. Uh, so a lot of points. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Lili Mwangi, for the great insights. And on that very note, we lock this particular session as we cross over to a different one all together to discuss the current affairs. Keep dropping your SMSs, keep calling us, and of course, keep sending those messages on our social media pages at Linda underscore Lela TV 47. We get to sample some of your comments as we proceed after this break. <laughs>